So our next speaker in our lineup of scholars is Eugenie Schinkel. Eugenie's senior lecturer in photographic theory and criticism at the University of Westminster, and her research interests and publications are extensive too, and cover topics including landscape, video gaming, and fashion photography. And in particular, Eugenie's work examines ideas about embodiment and haptic experience across these territories, drawing from ideas in neuroscience as well as from visual theory. So let's welcome Eugenie, please. Thanks, Annabella. Um, and in case anyone's worried, I've timed this at nine minutes and 24 seconds. <laughs> so um, just some really quick remarks and apologies for scripting. It's just so I don't jabber and go off track. Um, the term self is actually a slightly misleading one. Though it's short for self-portrait, or ostensibly short for self-portrait, uh, the selfie is something quite different from what we're accustomed to thinking of as a self-portrait. Um, it's not a reflective, carefully considered study. Uh, it's taken on the spur of the moment, so it doesn't claim to capture the subject in the fullness of their character. Um, often it's not even the subject's face that is the focus of the shot. Most selfies are not meant to linger very long in memory. Um, they're ephemeral by definition, replaced almost immediately with another image showing the latest look, the latest party, the latest holiday destination. Um, nor is the selfie intended for the closed circle of the family album. Nearly all selfies undergo an immediate transformation from private to public as they're launched out into cyberspace to be viewed by anyone and grabbed by anyone like myself. Um, the selfie is the love child, or perhaps the self-love child, of the Web 2.0 generation. The selfie asks us to think about memory, identity, and selfhood in very different ways than conventional self-portraiture does. And I want very briefly to address one specific issue, um, and this is an issue that has to do not just with memory, but with the way that memory is created and the technology that we use to create it. So what defines the selfie, in other words, is not just the self that's in it, it's also about the relationship between the self and technology. So with that in mind, I want to think about the way that some small, seemingly insignificant changes in our relations with cameras in the selfie signal some quite profound changes in the way we think of ourselves as human subjects. Now, I want to argue that the selfie is more than just a picture of a self taken by that self. And I want to begin by looking at a very long history of the self in the selfie. Now, as humans, our experience of the world is mediated by technologies. It's part of what makes us humans, tool use. In the West, some of the most important of these technologies are visual or lens-based ones, such as cameras. Now, visual technologies mediate our relation to the world by <coughs> imposing themselves between the eye and what it sees. So glasses are a really simple example. If you look at the world through your glasses, your relation to the world is no longer eye world. It's eye lens world even though the lens itself is not ideally the subject of your vision. But the fact remains that we learn to see differently when we see through such technologies. They change our relationship to the world, if only in a barely perceptible way. Now, historically, this mediated relation to the world has had some really significant implications for the way we think about the human subject or the self. From the Renaissance until well into the 19th, and in some cases even the 20th century, linear perspective has provided a model for human vision and an analogy for the relationship between the individual and the world. In the 18th century, the camera obscura acted as a model for the self. Now, there's some significant similarities between these models and the Cartesian idea of the self. All of them imply an essentially private subject, a disembodied eye, distanced from the world, distanced, as Paul has pointed out, from its own body, a self whose experience of the world is provided by images that enter through the eye and are pro projected and analyzed in the dark chamber of the mind, um, a model that's sometimes known as the Cartesian theater. Now, not, not only do we learn to see differently, but we learn to act differently when our vision's mediated. Lens-based technologies require us to adapt our bodily position in particular ways. Now, in the West, again, we've been doing this since the Renaissance. Linear perspective, for example, called on the viewer of a picture to stand or to sit, in this case, in one place rather than moving around, and ideally to see with a single unmoving eye, as that's what that little obelisk thing is doing in the picture here, um, rather than with two constantly moving eyes. 
Now we become quite accustomed to accommodating our body to different kinds of technologically mediated seeing. And cameras in particular demand a range of very specific bodily disciplines. Anyone who's ever used a large format camera for the first time will be familiar with the performance involved in focusing. You grope blindly for the controls while you struggle to keep the dark cloth from falling into your eyes. Early cameras, which came equipped with their own mobile laboratory of volatile chemicals, must have felt daunting, even antagonistic. Certainly not something to be taken out casually to record a family outing. What a contrast to something like the brownie camera, a friendly, undemanding piece of equipment, small enough to be cradled against the body. Kodak made much of the newfound intimacy between the camera and its user in their marketing of photography to women. Now, for many years, the symbolic gesture for taking a photo, which was this, lifting both arms to the face and clicking with the index finger, was modeled on the use of an SLR camera. Within the last decade, however, this gesture has changed. Nowadays, it's the camera phone that provides the shorthand, and we mime taking a photo with one arm extended and the thumb at the ready. And that seemingly insignificant swap from two hands to one, from the forefinger to the thumb, is huge, because what it signals is a completely different way of accommodating the camera to our body, a different way of incorporating it into our bodily actions, and of course, a different way of sharing the images we produce. Now, nearly all camera phone functions are completely automatic. There's one button, there's no fiddling about, there's no waiting for the right moment. The camera phone's been described as a wearable technology, very much part of the user's image, more like an item of clothing or jewelry than a technological artifact. We incorporate the camera phone so thoroughly into our perceptual experience that it tends to withdraw as the focus of our attention. Rather than intervening between the self and the world, it has become an essential part of our encounter with the world. Now, there's a specific sense that enables us to incorporate tools within our bodily boundaries, and it's called proprioception. Now, proprioception is one of three so-called hidden senses um, that were discovered in the 19th century. So the th three are called proprioception. That's the sense that tells us where our body is in space. That allows me, for instance, to tell that my hand's above my head, even though I'm not looking at it. There's also kinesthesia, which is basically the sense that allows us to see whether, to feel whether our body's moving or not, and vestibular sense, which is the sense that allows us to know whether we're upright or not. Um, these senses work together. They're very difficult to separate in theory. But um, to give a very basic account, proprioception is the, um, the mechanism that allows us, for instance, to feel the road through the wheels of a car or a motorcycle, um, to find the ball accurately with a tennis racket. Um, proprioceptive sense, in short, is what able, enables us to use tools with such fluency that they effectively stop being foreign objects and begin to act as extensions of the body. Now, including the camera in the photographic self-portrait used to be a bit of a novelty, a creative conceit signaling that the subject of the photo was also the photographer. Recently, it's not only the gesture of holding the camera, but the camera itself that has become part of the image, part of the language of the selfie. This subtle and seemingly insignificant transition, in fact, signals an important shift in the boundaries of the body, and thus in the nature of the self. Within a relatively short time, this small mobile technology has become so thoroughly integrated into our habits, our self-image, and our comportment, that we no longer ask what it's doing in a self-portrait. And it's not just the camera, but the act of photographing itself that's part of this technologically enabled self, part of the way we define ourselves in a networked world. Image making is part of the fabric of who we are. It's part of the fabric of everyday life. The act of depicting ourselves is no longer about capturing a moment. It's a continuous event, a kind of extended self-representation. With the selfie, we represent ourselves to ourselves and to others as networked beings, as public distributed selves composed of an endless succession of images. And we understand this image self as part of a continuous, constantly renewed flow of networked information. Um, just before I got here, I was reading a statistic that said that something like 880 billion images are destined to be uploaded to the internet in the next 12 months. Um, that's quite a lot. <laughs> we understand this image self, as I said, as part of a continuous, constantly renewed flow of, of networked in information. 
When we create and share a selfie, we become willing and knowing participants in an endless procession of images who aim is, whose aim is not the generation of memory, but the generation of yet more images. And all of this dispersal, I would argue, does not signal a self that has lost its integrity. Instead, it signals a self whose boundaries have changed. Now, thinking about selfies, as Paul has pointed out, it doesn't need to involve necessarily heavy-duty notions of the self, but it does provoke questions about the nature of who we are. Photographic self-portrait is nothing new, but the intimate entanglement of the camera phone with our bodies and our lives means that we no longer think of such technologies as distancing ourselves from the world. The selfie self is quite, something quite different from the self implied by earlier visual technologies, the disembodied eye standing apart from the world, observing it from a distance. And this difference is played out for each of us every day in that difference between the forefinger and the thumb, the difference between leaving the camera out of the picture or leaving it in. And this difference between, th between seeing through a camera, um, this is the difference between seeing through a camera and a more empathic relation that blurs in exciting ways, the difference between the human and the technological worlds, the idea of seeing with a camera. Thank you. That was, I found that quite touching, actually, and a good riposte to some of these criticisms in the press where you think that civilization is doomed to collapse because of the amount of selfies that are being produced. Um, I think this is something we'll come back to, this kind of moral debate. And I really like this idea also of the selfie self, this new kind of self that wasn't there before. I think that's really interesting. So thank you, Eugenie. <laughs>